Thanks. Hi, my name is Klaus Tub. I, um, well, I'm a technologist and uh, a researcher, and I work for an organization, a small NGO called Tactical Tech, uh, based in Berlin, uh, which primarily works with rights activists, uh, helping them um, use digital technology and information more effectively in advocacy work. But I also spend chunks of my time in India, uh, where for the last few years I've been doing some research around the current state of internet censorship and mass surveillance that the government, in, government of India has been implementing in that country. Um, today I'm uh, going to be discussing a specific incident uh, that happened earlier this year which uh, was a censorship order, uh, well, uh, um, a censorship order that uh, the government of India issued, which brought down a bunch of really popular uh, websites uh, for several days in the country. Um, and I'm going to talk about how, what prompted this order, how it was uh, issued by the government, the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology of India. Uh, how the ISPs reacted to it and implemented these blocks and what they could have done differently. Um, and also um, some of the research we did about how these uh, blocks were implemented uh, in terms of what technology was used by the internet service providers and um, how users could circumvent uh, these specific blocks. Um, so, um, Last year, uh, around the 17th of December, there was uh, a order issued, a censorship order issued by the, the Ministry of Communications and IT, which asked every single internet service provider in the country to block access to 32 websites. Um, we saw a bunch of websites going down every now and then um, across different ISPs in the country. Didn't quite understand what was going on until the 31st of December, which was a day after last Congress when I woke up in a hotel room in Hamburg to a leaked, uh, a, a copy of, uh, uh, of the secret order that was leaked, which revealed uh, that there was a ban uh, implemented by the MCIT, uh, which was uh, issued to every single ISP and asked the ISPs not to disclose that this order was issued or what was in that order. Um, that, uh, I'm not sure how uh, legible that is on the screen, but basically what this said was uh, block 32 URLs that are listed in this, uh, in this letter um, immediately and that uh, no ISP is allowed to actually disclose the contents of, the, of this letter um, or reproduce the names of the URLs uh, in the letter. Um, this was done using uh, the Section 69A of the Information Technology Act, which uh, uh, the IT Act is from uh, the year 2000, but it was amended in 2008, right after the Mumbai terrorist attacks. And now is this uh, uh, draconian law, which is used by the government of India to conduct uh, um, enormous amounts of mass surveillance, but also censorship in the country. Um, we've had some wins to get rid of specific sections of this act, one of which was uh, called the uh, 66A, which in the face of it existed to prevent online harassment, but was, uh, well, mostly used by uh, political, uh, powerful politicians to go after innocent citizens trying to criticize governance in the country. Uh, 69A still exists, unfortunately. It, uh, it's something that gives them a lot of control over being able to um, block any, uh, any internet resource without having to go uh, to the courts. And this is what was used. And, and uh, what this does not uh, state, however, is that these orders have to be secret. That was something that they said in that order and then said that any ISP who uh, refu uh, who refused to uh, keep that order secret could be, um, well, uh, they could take action against them. Um, now, what were, what was the reason? This is something we learned a little bit later. The reason that they sent the secret order out, turns out, was because the Mumbai police, the anti-terrorism squad of the Mumbai police on the 15th of November went to the Ministry of Communications and IT and said that we've found instances of jihadi propaganda on 
uh, by international groups on specific websites. Therefore, we would like you to pass, pass an order uh, requesting ISPs to block access to these websites. Um, some of the URLs that were affected were, <laughs> I'll give you a second to process that. Yeah, github.com, uh, vimeo.com, pastebin, sourceforge, archive.org, amongst others. Um, turns out they found um, uh, some objectionable content on gist.github.com and on pastebin.com, which prompted them to, say, block these. Uh, we have no idea why Vimeo was blocked. Um, something that I find disturbing and hilarious at the same time was SourceForge. Uh, the a specific URL that was, uh, that was blocked on SourceForge was an open source project which was a clone of Pastebin. Um, so they were not blocking content in this case. They were actually blocking access to open source code, which they did not want people to download. Um, that's the complete block list. Uh, probably not very legible again, but uh, it's, um, it's mostly Basebin and similar services. Uh, it also has some free web hosting services which are blocked um, and uh, popular media services such as Vimeo.com and Dailymotion.com and archive.org, which is basically the largest uh, uh, internet archive uh, on the internet. Um, so yeah, this was, New Year's Eve, um, I was at a party with a few friends, a um, um, bunch of geeks, uh, as, like we do on New Year's, hang out with our friends. Um, and I started talking to a few people, a couple of them are in this room uh, right now, and um, we thought it may be a, it may be a good idea to uh, conduct some investigation about how these blocks were being implemented and how people could circumvent these blocks. Uh, so between the 1st and the 3rd of January, we spent uh, several hours um, trying to uh, collect censorship measurements across uh, multiple ISPs in India. We were able to do this across seven different ISPs, including the state-run uh, Mahanagar Telecom uh, Nigam Limited, which is one of the largest ISPs in India, and Tata Communications, uh, again, uh, uh, one of the larger internet service providers in the country. And we realized, well, the, the block order said, the, uh, well, uh, uh, specified what to block, but did not actually say how the, this block should be implemented. Not surprised about that. And unsurprisingly, this led to different ISPs using uh, various uh, uh, different techniques to uh, um, block these URLs. Uh, in some cases, the same ISP was using different techniques um, to implement this block, uh, implement these blocks. Um, and we uh, collected this. Uh, we collected this data uh, over a period of uh, a few days, uh, and uh, realized that there were multiple different uh, techniques being used. And the most uh, the most common ways we found were either uh, well, M MTNL in this case was using a combination of DNS hijacking, where basically they um, and, and their name uh, 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 name resolvers. Uh, just point you to a different IP and not the uh, IP address of the actual host that you're requesting. Uh, in some cases, they were basically blocking any access, any direct access to the IP or the host requested. Um, in some scenarios, they were only blocking HTTP URLs. Therefore, you could just access something that was blocked by going to the HTTPS, the secure uh, version of that website. Uh, the most invasive method that was being used, uh, uh, definitely by Tata Communications and a few others, was uh, deep packet inspection, which basic, uh, which is uh, an ISP actively dissecting tra uh, users' traffic um, uh, and um, uh, 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 denying access to any, any unauthorized co uh, uh, content. Mm. We used a few different ways to try and collect this data. Um, one of the ways was to use a popular open source um, censorship measurement toolkit called UNI, uh, the Open Observatory of Network Interference. Uh, um, and we also relied on a lot of friends who were in India. We were all in Berlin. We did not actually have um, ac uh, we were not we did not actually have access to machines connected to uh, networks in India. So we 
I remember waking up a bunch of friends in the middle of the night going, hey, what's going on? If you try to access this, can you tell us what's going on? Can you try and run these tests for us? Um, and some people actually did stay up really late at night in India and helped us do this, which was great. We also did, uh, well, actually, um, uh, um, I, when I say we, uh, uh, a lot of uh, 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 two people who uh, were very, very helpful doing this were Leif uh, Riga and Aaron Gibson, who are right here in this room. And Aaron happens to be one of uh, uh, one of the developers of the Uni project. And thanks. Uh, so. We document all of this in a couple of articles, which I'll, uh, um, I have links to in a later slide if you want to read more about the specific uh, forms of uh, 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 specific uh, techniques used by the ISPs and how we could circumvent uh, uh, these bans. And yeah, to circumvent them, like I said, some people, uh, some ISPs were only blocking HTTP uh, 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 versions of the website, and uh, we, we just we were just able to get to them using the HTTPS uh, version. Um, irrespective of that, I uh, highly recommend that everyone just use HTTPS everywhere in their web browsers at all times, which is a plugin developed by EFF, which uh, in, in, uh, uh, for a lot of websites will present you with an HTTPS version of the website, even if you make a request to the HTTP version. Uh, DNS-based, uh, DNS hijacking could be circumvented by just using a different uh, name server. Uh, there's a lot of public name servers out there, most popular ones, a lot, uh, well, uh, some, uh, a couple of really popular ones being the Google's public DNS and open DNS. Um, there were a few others, with any, basically any public DNS server that was outside of India uh, helped us uh, circumvent DNS hijacking. Uh, we realized that at no point were we not able to access any of these 32 blocked URLs uh, using Tor and um, or, 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 or most VPNs, uh, virtual private networks that we uh, used or some proxies. Uh, so it wasn't really very difficult to get around these blocks. Um, and um, the, the, um, 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 it's just that we had to understand how different ISPs were doing it and what the most efficient way of getting uh, around it was. Um, and um, so that's what we did between the first and third, and we wrote about it. But since then, um, we uh, one of the things that we did was set up a, um, a server in India where we started collecting reports using uh, Uni. And uh, uh, we've just left that running, and we've been collecting that, uh, that data continuously. And something that I've been starting to work on um, of late is trying to make sense of all the data that we've collected over the year and publish it in a sensible way and maybe visualize it in ways. Um, and it's we've been doing this not just for the 32 URLs that were on, uh, in that censorship order, but using a couple of different lists, including those those 32, but also a web developer in India called Tejesh GN, who has been compiling a list of uh, URLs that have been reported as being censored in India. Um, we also um, have always uh, uh, um, welcomed any help that anyone wants to give us in terms of reporting censorship or uh, 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 software developers, technologists who want to help run uh, censorship measurement uh, um, using UNI or other methods. Um, to help us, so there is an email address out there if, uh, which, uh, if, if you want to get in touch with us uh, to help us continue these efforts. Um, another thing that uh, I recently started working on is uh, turning that website chaoslab.in into something that could be a continued effort on measuring censorship in India and, uh, um, and publishing all this data there. So hopefully that will happen at some point soon. Um, just to talk about what the ISPs could have done slightly differently here, um, or what ISPs should do when they are dealing with censorship orders issued to them. Um, no ISP actually informed any of their customers until that uh, order was leaked to us that this order uh, that that they were asked to censor any of the, the uh, these URLs. Um, I think every ISP should take this really seriously. They should be more transparent about censorship orders and, and whenever possible inform their customers as promptly as they can 
that they have received uh, um, an order to block access to an internet resource. Um, also, there's, um, especially in India, there is no law that requires any internet service provider to deploy um, any kind of invasive technology such as uh, doing deep packet, uh, such as technology that helps them do deep packet inspection, uh, amongst other things. Therefore, I would like every, all of us to appeal to our internet service providers to uh, and say, don't deploy unnecessary um, invasive technology in your infrastructure when you don't need to. That just uh, makes it a lot more difficult for people to act, uh, for the for governments to actually pressure you into using technology like this to block access to the internet and. Um, use legal means as an ISP to fight for your um, customers' freedom to access of information and uh, expression. Um, a good example we saw earlier this year was when in the Netherlands, Access for All and uh, Zigo um, went to the courts, proved that a ban that was issued on the Pirate Bay two year, uh, uh, well in 2012 was not necessary because there was no proof that them banning the Pirate Bay actually led to uh, fewer copyright infr infringements because people were getting around it. Therefore, the ISPs didn't need to block it. Um, but yeah, the point here is they did actually use the legal measures to fight for the, uh, the right to freedom of access uh, of information for, of their customers. Um, and yeah, I think it's also important that as consumers, we put more pressure on the providers, when you see something that is blocked, write to your ISP or call them and say, hey, this is blocked, why? Tell us, tell us now um, and tell us what you're doing about it. Also, tell them that your customers are unhappy that they cannot access uh, what they're paying you to access and, tell, and, and pass that on to the, uh, 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 to the authorities who are asking you to uh, block, uh, block access to these internet resources. Um, some of the, uh, so, so, uh, well, uh, so, uh, talk, I'm just going to mention some things that uh, that helped uh, uh, that the, that we recommended in the articles we wrote um, to people who uh, were being affected by these blocks and uh, how they could circumvent it. The Tor project, I think, the Tor project is probably one of my favorite uh, inventions of, of our times, and it's probably the most important tool uh, that's working towards defending our internet freedoms today. So yeah, just use Tor all the time. <laughs> and everybody. Um, Security in a Box is a toolkit that Tactical Tech, the organization I work for, develops, which is a set of tactics and tools that helps users uh, protect their data and their communications using various different uh, tactics and encryption tools and um, has a few sections on how you can circumvent uh, censorship or use uh, to uh, how you can install and use tools such as the Tor browser to uh, stay anonymous and um, and protect your um, identity and uh, and be able to circumvent censorship if you are being affected by it in, where you are and um, uh, I'd like to plug uh, the EFF here, EFF, uh, who developed HTTPS Everywhere, which I mentioned in, uh, in the talk earlier, also have been uh, publishing something called the Self-Surveillance Defense Toolkit, which uh, is similar to um, the kind of work we do, it has some very useful guides about how you can use tools to protect your internet freedoms. Um, I'm going to slowly move towards try and wrapping this up. These are the two articles I couldn't fit the whole URLs in there. I don't know how to use uh, uh, LibreOffice Impress very well. Uh, and um, so those are the tiny URLs. These slides I will uh, publish online and tweet about it. Uh, but I guess if you watch the video, you'll be able to find them too. But that's uh, an article that uh, Leif, Aaron, um, Claudio Guarneri, and I wrote in the Huffington Post right after we uh, uh, did this research last year, and also Claudio followed up with an article in the Glo in Global Voices, where he actually talks about how we should be um, asking our ISPs to defend our freedoms and how, what we can do as customers of these internet service providers to make the internet a better place. 
for everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's how you can find me. I'm Houndby on Twitter, and that's my email address, Cosplay Tactical Tech. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we have some time for some questions, if there's any. Please forward to the microphone. <coughs> So I have a question. So you mentioned that Tata Com probably used DPI, right? And um, it sounds like they had DPI deployed before the order was given out. So could you speculate on why it was kind of deployed and maybe it might be in use? Well, it's not uncommon uh, for ISPs to get orders um, which are asking them to block in, uh, specific internet resources in, in India at all. Where, in fact, when we were doing this research, we found a bunch of other lists that we could throw into the scripts we were using, uh, including the UNI stuff, and we found that there was a lot of different kind of stuff that was being censored, uh, most commonly uh, file sharing websites to prevent piracy, but also a lot of pornography um, and uh, a few other things. So, it, and, and, and um, this is not the first time that we've seen something that is really popular being blocked in India. We saw whole of groups.yahoo.com go down a few years ago because, again, uh, the Ministry of Communications and IT sent out an order to the ISPs, this time not a secret order, uh, fortunately for us. Therefore, we knew what was going on. Um, but they, they found something that they thought was inciting violence uh, 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 in the country and asked, uh, Every ISP to block it. So, and it's 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 something that's very common. They uh, ISPs are dealing with censorship orders uh, quite often in the country. Therefore, uh, they have been um, investing in technology that helps them. Um, Do you think that they're using DPI for data collection on their citizens? Well, I can. Well, I would only speculate if I were to answer that question. Therefore, I would say I am uh, I'm not certain if they are doing that, and we have no evidence that they are actually doing that. Uh, thanks. Cheers. Thank you so much. If there's any question, please forward to one of the mics. Um, two questions. The first is, uh, does some uh, national or specialized media uh, ever wrote an article about that censorship happening in India, within India. And the second is, uh, there were a spike in the usage, uh, in the amount of Tor users in India after that, uh, cens that censorship order has been implemented. Um, to answer the first question, yeah, there was, there has been, uh, there was massive coverage of the two really large incidents. One. Uh, one of them being this, and the other one uh, I mentioned earlier when groups.yahoo.com uh, uh, was blocked for, I think, over a week uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, it has been covered by, uh, by large uh, news media outlets. It has been reported. Uh, this one was also reported after, um, after um, People like us and the Center for Internet and Society in India made a lot of noise on Twitter and social media about these blogs. Um, sorry, Fabio, what was your second question? And if there were a spike in the um, users in India due to that. Yeah, I think uh, Leaf tried to look into this right after, and I don't remember if we saw anything that uh, was, maybe it was, but I don't think we saw any. We talked about it. Maybe we didn't pay a lot of attention, but I think that's something we probably should actively monitor every time something like this happens, and I'll put that, put that on my checklist. <laughs> Two. There is also a question from the, someone from the internet. Okay, the question is, did the Indian government or the ASP have any advice or assistance from external, for example, meaning foreign companies or agencies to implement these blocks? So like uh, the hacking team or three letter agencies? Um, we did find evidence of uh, some invasive deep packet inspection technology that was, so, uh, that was being used by Tata 
uh, by a company called Sifi Connect. I cannot remember where they were from, but I'm pretty certain that they were not Indian. Um, and actually, if you read the uh, Huffington Post article that I linked to earlier, we have all the uh, different block pages that we saw across different ISPs, and they varied. And one of them is actually a lot big advertisement for this co company that was selling technology to uh, the ISP that was uh, using using uh, using their uh, tech to uh, conduct this block. And the second question is about virtual private networks. Are there any virtual private networks provided in, uh, providers in India that were not affected by these requests? So um, we weren't able to uh, do a lot of testing with virtual private networks in India. Um, we did, however, notice. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I, uh, the answer to that question is um, I am. I don't know. Uh, I am not certain. We did, however, notice that. The blocks were very extremely inconsistent. We were able to access certain things on specific ISPs at times, which uh, subsequently were blocked uh, using the same network connection. At, uh, some ISPs uh, were not blocking all 32 URLs. We were able to uh, access a, a specific set of those 32 URLs on some ISPs at all times um, uh, with no interruptions. Uh, with, uh, so, yeah, I, um, uh, but uh, we did not actually get around to testing using VPNs in India. Uh, we have a question. I was wondering, in the light of your talk, what you're thinking of the latest revelations with the, uh, the free basics. Uh, yeah, you're probably expecting this. <laughs> What am I expecting? So no, no, um, no. I, no, I thought you expected a question about okay, this. Okay. Uh, no, no. I was just what wondering I, what, what you I think were... about yeah. uh, uh, what's happening with. Um, so this is something that we've been fighting uh, uh, with the uh, government and the Telecom Regula Regula Regulatory Authority of India with for a little while now, for over a year. Um, they put out um, a, a, basically a consultation call about a year ago, asking. People to respond, and uh, as uh, uh, and uh, and several uh, organizations, civil society organizations in India, amongst others, actually responded saying, "No, no, we do not want uh, internet.org as it was known then um, adopted by any ISP in India." But, uh, and uh, free, and now there is a second call by the TRAI, which um, is a follow-up to that first consultation call, where um, it's pretty much the same thing, basically. There is, um, uh, there, there was something that, uh, there was a judgment like about, uh, a week ago, uh, which basically asks Reliance Communications, which is actually the only, uh, only telecom service provider which has partnered with Facebook to provide free basic, basics in India, and asked them to temporarily suspend their, uh, 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 su uh, suspend this service to all their users. So that is a good sign, and we will hopefully have uh, some good news after at the end of this process after this consultation um, comes to well a conclusion if I may say yeah thank you so much I think if there is no further questions we will conclude this very interesting talk thank you thank you again.